Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27 makes this statement. The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are his everlasting arms this morning. Will you pause and pray with me? Father, I'm so thankful for your presence. God, that your purpose and plan is so much bigger than we could imagine. And God, how you've already moved in this room. We can't calculate the depth that you've reached to. God, we can't measure the reach that you've extended your arm to. God, the call of your voice is so prevalent. It's beyond the noise of the music and the melody. It's issuing an invitation to someone today and we echo that God we hear it and we pray that you would continue that call in the next few moments I pray that you give us ears to hear what the spirit is saying to our church God I pray that you would allow us to walk in the direction you give us I thank you for meeting with us today thank you for these people that love you I thank you for your word God that guides us and leads us We ask that you would continue to speak in the next few moments. In Jesus' name, we pray. Would someone say amen? Amen. 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 And you may be seated this morning. It may be a little early to speak about eternity. It's uh, 10.35 a.m. But if you'll just pause for a moment and allow your mind to extend and expand You kind of have to prep yourself to think about infinity and eternity and those things that go beyond our reach, what we're able to consider or imagine. And and it's just kind of, we got to pause for a minute. We got to say, okay, let's, let's just think for a minute about eternity. Let's think for a moment about infinity. It's, it's a great premise for fiction because to break the confines of time and think about eternity requires a level of faith. It requires us to step beyond ourselves because we live in the confines of time. We knew that this morning we wanted to be here if we wanted to get the seat that we usually do maybe a little before service start, but we knew that uh, history would tell us that right at 11 o'clock someone would, or 10 o'clock, that's going back a bit, 10 o'clock somebody would come to this podium and we would begin service. And so we, <clears throat> we wear wristwatches, we walk with our Phones open sometimes just to calculate what the time may be. We set alarms. We have reminders. We have calendars and dates. And we live in the confines of time. But if we can just let our mind go for a moment this morning, the God that we serve and the God that we sang about this morning isn't confined to time. He he lives on another level. He he interacts with us on this time frame that we live in, but, but he lives at another level. He lives in an, in an eternal realm. The, the Bible doesn't attempt to qualify God's nature. There's no explanation about his beginning. Ours, yes. His, no. If you go all the way back to the beginning or our beginning, he was there before. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God. It, it, I, I could stop right there, and that's the sermon. The eternal God. In the beginning, God was already there. In the very beginning of time, God was there. He existed. He pre-existed everything that we see. He's eternally past, eternally present, and eternally future. He is an eternal God. And, and Genesis 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The usual stuffy science world is buzzing this month. The first five pictures on July the 11th from the James Webb Space Telescope made their way back to little old earth. Ten billion dollars of technology technology shot up into the heavens and July 12th was the first day that our world got to see the photos that were sent back five pictures I can do that math 10 billion dollars five photos that's two billion dollars per picture 
One of those pictures is on our center screen. Maybe we just bring the lights down for a moment. And they, they say that the James Webb Telescope, that it basically, in its extension, with all of its technology, if you were to take your arm and extend it to arm's length and you put just one pebble of sand between your fingers, that what we see uh, through the lens of that $10 billion telescope is what would exist at arm's length, what would be hidden be behind that one single simple grain of sand, the heavens. Yet, the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Science, with all of its effort and its extent of ability, has created this. This is uh, one of the first color photographs to come back. It's absolutely incredible. It's amazing. They said that there isn't any place that the telescope can see to that there isn't something happening. Galaxies and stars forming and being formed. And, and there's just this incredible environment that never before have we even had the ability to see, but with all oh, just a few $10 billion. Yeah, we get the privilege of a $2 billion photograph Sunday morning service today. New to us. Right there on the center screen, they said that President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris asked to see the pictures in advance. They met in secrecy in the White House to do so. And one commentator mentioned that they were just like kids. Another host said they geeked out. Anybody geeked out this morning? I would have kind of liked to see some, hear a little bit of, <sighs> yeah, thanks. <sighs> Just, you know, but it is when you stop and pause and think that this isn't something fabricated. This isn't something that we created. This isn't an artist's rendition of what it might be. This is the actual, just one little pebble of sand on the sky environment is what we're observing right now. And God said, you know what? God made it, the heavens and the earth. He just kind of said, I'm going to create that. I'm going to allow that to come in existence. God speaks it into existence. And we haven't even seen it until this past few weeks. We've never, with our naked eye, had the ability or the opportunity to observe it. But, but there it is. And God said, oh, it was there all along. It was there before you ever came into being. I just kind of created it. That's who I am. That's a little bit of my nature. The more that you seek, the more that you find. The, the more that you look, the more that you're going to be able to observe. It's just a little picture of who I am. It's a, just, a, just a little observation of my intensity, my ability, my eternal existence. It's right there. The more you reach, the more you're going to find. I am so much deeper. I am so much further. I am so much greater. We're talking about the eternal God this morning. Aren't you glad that you know him? Aren't you glad that you, that you experienced his presence, that the God that created that moved in this room this morning? I, I began to just sense his presence as we sang a few of the songs. I heard his voice when we began to sing about he called me out of the grave. That God is here. The God that created that, his prized creation, sits in the seat next to you. His greatest work stands in the room and sings along with us this morning. He loved you so much. You are his greatest creation. So space, they've, they've captured the science world's attention, not just because of curiosity, but also in an effort to understand they have Einstein's theory of relativity, what time and space, how they, he believed them to be interconnected. And, and I think sometimes science, their effort is to, to look beyond, to reach out, because somehow they're trying to explain why we're here, or rather how we're here. How did we get here? Can we find another planet, planet in formation? Can we find life somewhere else? Can, can we, and, and I, let's not get into that. I'll, I'll call you back. Come on back. But, you know, fiction is excited at the possibilities and the, the ability for science and time, that interlink, that we might be able to travel through time someday. It's, I'm not much of a science fiction guy, so I'll probably do it no justice at all. But, but the idea is fascinating. It would be so cool. I'll use that geeked out word. Cool. To be able to travel ahead in time and see the future would be amazing to travel back in time. We could answer so many questions. We could 
make so many better decisions. We could measure people's motives. We could plan for what is now the unknown. We could correct our errors. We could move into the past and fix our futures. How many have ever said, if I could just go back... I wouldn't have done this, or I wouldn't have said that. I would not have gone there. I would have taken more time. I would have made that trip. I wouldn't have made that trip. We would all love to be able to put the vehicle of life in reverse and have a second take at a moment that we've already lived. That hour, that day, that week. It's, it's that confines of time that we live in that we can't go back once the word is beyond our lips. We can't retract it. Once the action has been taken, we can't go back. It's, it's there, cemented in time. And sometimes that's wonderful. We have memories that we enjoy reminding ourselves about, but sometimes that's fearful because there are things that we never want to relive. There are things that, that we never want to go back to. We don't even want people to know about it. If we could change it, we would. There's, there's just all kinds of things in the past. We, we live in that realm of time. And when we begin to understand God, that he knows all and sees all. But beyond that, he is in all. He exists everywhere. He's the the God of omnipresence. He is everywhere present. He is nowhere absent. He is. He fills all space. And then that would affirm if Einstein had any idea, if he was right at all, that God would fill also all time. And he is eternal. It works together to allow us to understand that mind-boggling idea of eternity. Sometimes when we don't understand it, we, we, we get fearful. But we don't need to fear it. The reason is because eternity is beautiful when you learn about the nature of God. Deuteronomy 33 verse 27, it says that the eternal God, someone say eternal, is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. But it's not just there in our text. It's also there in Scripture. If you'll, if you'll find the, the next verse, it talks to us about how that God is that eternal God. He, he doesn't, let me just find myself in my notes. My iPad just went out of time for a moment. The eternal God, he doesn't exist in time. Backing up to that verse. You guys want to give me the next verse while I find myself here? <clears throat> we can answer so many questions. We can put those real there. Time is going to be out. If there's a. Okay, check one. Find these are Okay, got that. Make that point. Skip that. Okay. Romans 120. There we are. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. That the eternal God that we serve has eternal power. That his existence, he, he doesn't just exist, but he is a powerful God. That, that photo that we were looking at reveals the eternal power of God. That the things that are made, the Bible says, the invisible things of him. From the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and the Godhead. So that picture, the things that we could never see but now we can, it explains to us that, that those things that we see explain the eternal creation ability of God. He's that eternal God. That, that those, those stars are a representation of an eternal God. We, we serve that eternal God. Romans 9.5 calls him the eternally blessed God. Ephesians 3.11 speaks of his eternal purpose. 1 Timothy 1.17 calls him the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. Genesis 21 verse 33 says he is the everlasting God. That's the God that we're serving today. That's the God that we're talking about. Psalm 101 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. There's seven commands there. It gives us seven commands. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. 
Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Just seven points that, that we can kind of take into our being and say, you know what? There's some things that I've got to integrate into my life. Make a joyful noise. I, I wonder if we could just pause for a moment and allow his presence to be that today. Let, let's allow our noise to be a joyful noise. I, I wonder if someone would just serve the Lord with gladness. Would someone realize we're going to come before his presence with singing? Someone know that God, he is God. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Could we do that together this morning? Would someone just kind of let God know how great he is? Someone allow just one of those seven commands to be a reality for you right now? God, we worship you right here. God, we celebrate you right now. We celebrate you in this place. Those are the what's that we're commanded to do. But verse 5 gives us the why. It says, for the Lord, he is good. The reason why we do all those, those things is because God is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. I, I just wanted to remind us that we don't have to be fearful of eternity. Why? Because he talks about the good things that allow us to understand his eternal nature. His mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. Everybody, everywhere has the privilege of knowing God in his great mercy. Everybody, everywhere has the privilege of knowing the truth of God. It endureth. It isn't stopping. It's not, there's, there's not just this limitation in our lifespan. God says, I'm going to let my truth endure to every generation. Everybody is going to have the opportunity to know God in his eternal greatness. I, I know, I know we can't fully comprehend an eternal God, but that's all right. A God who is small enough to be understood isn't big enough to be worshipped. If we can get our mind wrapped around God, then we may as well make an idol to him because he's that small. If we can get our mind wrapped around just how uh, our, the God that we serve, if we could just understand him top to bottom, left to right, then, then we may as well just make an image or an idol. But but God said, don't make an image or an idol because you can't confine me to that small of a space. You can't big and build an idol big enough that would represent me. Our God is extended beyond that. He is an eternal God. He's greater. A God who is small enough to be understood isn't big enough to be worshipped. But the God that we're talking about this morning is worthy of our worship because he's bigger. He's greater. He's enough. Come on, he can. We serve a God that has abundant ability. He's not limited. He's unlimited. He's not restricted. He's unrestricted. He's greater. He's that kind of God this morning. I, I don't want a God that's small enough for me to understand. I want a God that somehow I've got to search him out. I've got to get in his word and find out there's another layer. There's another depth. There's someplace down just a little deeper because then I understand that no matter how low life takes me, I can find that underneath are the everlasting arms. Oh, you don't understand, Pastor Jack. I got to the very bottom let me tell you when you get to the very bottom underneath are the everlasting arms when you get to the bottom of where life takes you down the road when you fall to the lowest depth when you're in the lowest valley I just wanted to remind somebody there's a room full of people that knew that when they got down to the very bottom they found that underneath were the everlasting arms that God reached them and picked them up he turned them around he established their going we're preaching about a God like that. Come on, I don't want a God that's so small that he can't take care of the biggest problem in my life. Eternity. Come on, eternity is woven into every truth in Scripture eternally past he stooped down and framed the world that we were in eternally present he's right here right now he's not just a storybook on a dusty shelf in history he's watching he's working he's moving he's speaking he's reaching he's calling he's hearing he's listening he's acting he's come on he's intervening he's that God today he's eternally existent and there there he is in the future when we read the prophetic promises, God is there. I, I won't take the time to, 
to go into the book of Revelation, but he's, he's there. He's there when the end of time ends. And we move into that place called eternity with him. He's there. God is there. He's proved that he's aware of what's going on next. He's not caught off guard. He's never surprised. God knows exactly where you are right now. He's not put off. He hasn't stepped back. He's moved in. He's leaning in right now. He's reaching, saying, come on, somebody. Come to know me better. There never was a time when he was not. There never will be a time when he ceases to be. His qualities are infinite. His love will never end. His mercy will never cease. His truth will never expire. His holiness is eternal. His work will continue. His word will always continue to speak. Aren't you glad that you serve an eternal God this morning? That, that's, that's what we're talking about. Our God is an eternal God. Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. I, I just pulled a few verses out of the psalm because we got to know the God of yesterday. The psalmist wanted to remind us, hide not thy face from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. Someone say, have been. Psalm 59 he said, but I'll sing of thy power, yea, I'll sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of trouble. Psalm 61, 3, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. Psalm 90, verse 1, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. It was Tuesday morning prayer. I was walking across the front here and, and some of those scriptures began to come to me about what God has been, how God has been there in our past. We have testimonies because God has been. He's been a shelter from the enemy. He has been our dwelling place in all generations. He's been my defense and refuge when the enemy come in like a flood. The spirit of the Lord lifted up a standard against him. Uh, God has been that. He's been. He, he has been that in our lives. I looked up the idiom has been. We, we, we got a world full of has beens. You, you got your five minutes of popularity on the platform or a stage somewhere, and, and then life just kind of shifts and you fade off into history, and people say, hey, what about that one hit wonder? We got people that there has been, they, they were popular or famous for a moment, but God doesn't diminish in his popularity over time. We, we can look and we can say, thou has been. But that isn't where it ends. The, the Hebrew, the writer of Hebrews said, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thou has been, but that's not where it ends. If you continue to work through the Psalms, Psalms 54 said, Behold, God is my helper. In Psalm 59, he said, For God is my defense. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength. Psalm 59, For God is my defense. He that is our God is the God of salvation. He's the God that was, and he's the God is. That is, he's Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today. But that's not where it ends. He is the God of forever. We need to know him in every level. The God of forever. The Lord shall be unto thee. If you look in scripture, you'll find all those prophetic promises. Why? Because God isn't going to cease his work. God isn't going to cease to be that God, he is eternal. We need a God like that. We see the eternal purpose of God in Acts 2, and we can come back to the music. When the multitude wanted to know what to do about sin, they were confronted with their past, and there in their present, they were concerned about what shall we do or what do we do now. If we crucified the Lord of glory, if we crucified the anointed one, if we crucified him, then what shall we do? If we put to death on the cross, cross the, the Christ, then what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Peter was identifying and addressing the issues that we all struggle with. 
We need a God with the ability to step into our past, our present, and our future. Why does God call us to a place of repentance? If I could just have your attention. I know music's coming. I know it's 1059. But I have your attention just for just a moment. Let me tell you what repentance does. It's so we determine here in our present that our future is not going to be like our past. That, that's, that's what repentance is. Repentance is when you say, you know what, I, I, I realize that my past brought me, brings me to this place of death. It brings me to this place, place of what am I going to do now? If I did that, what am I going to do now to ensure that my eternity and my eternity is impacted and secure and I walk into the plan that I have that that's where repentance is repentance is when we determine right here that my future is no longer going to be like my past repentance is when you make the decision I am turning my life toward God and I'm going to walk into the hope of salvation that he has for me and I'm going to leave my past behind that's the power that can happen in your present. Baptism. Baptism is because you can't take care of your past on your own. But we serve a God that says, let me take care of your past for you. Because God says, you live in the present. You can't go back to your past. But God says, hold, hold on a minute, but I am the God of eternity. I'm the eternal God, so I'll tell you what I will do. You go down in a watery grave of baptism, rise to walk in newness of life. I'm going to step back in eternity past, and I'm going to take care of the sin problem in your life. I'm going to wash it. The Old Testament writer said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Isaiah 1 verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He said, I'll take care of it. Let me, you be baptized. I'm going to wash the sin away. And the Holy Ghost that's where eternity future comes in. Because the Bible says that His Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. In other words, the Spirit is a little bit of eternal heaven that we get to have here on earth. It's just a little touch. It's an indicator. It's a reminder. It's proof. It's proof that we've got more in store than what we're walking in right now. And so God says, as the eternal God, He said, let me tell you what salvation's all about. He said, I'll take care of your past, I'll take care of your present, and I'll take care of your future. I'm going to take care of what's happened in your life, what's happening in your life, and what will happen. I am Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why we need a God that's eternal. That's why we need a, a message of repentance, because we're going to turn from the past. That's why we need a message of a baptism because God wants to wash the past away and that's why we need the Holy Ghost because if the same spirit that dwell in Christ dwell in you it will quicken your mortal body we've got the promise of eternity that's the message of salvation that's why it's powerful the eternal God it's just a little picture why did Peter preach what he preached because he knew that we needed a God that could take care of our yesterday our today and our tomorrow standing together with me this morning I know I know just standing in a room full of this many people that there's no doubt that somebody needs a God that can work on our past You see that? Would you pause for a moment? And would you pray? It's very personal right now. This is where this is where the message becomes yours. This is the moment where we allow the word to work in our lives. And I'm wondering if you would 
you would join together with me and just begin to invite God. He's invited you, but would you ask him to come? And God, we're praying right now. Lord, I don't know who needs it today, but I'd like to just lead a prayer of repentance. Father, I pray that you would wash us and cleanse us. God, we see, we acknowledge our sin has ever before us. That's what the psalmist said. It's right there in front of us through the songs that have been sung today, through the, the message that's been preached. The enemy has constantly reminded us. He's badgered us. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's that voice of conscience. First, he invites us to fail, and then he condemns us when we do. That voice has been active in the room today. But there's another voice that we hear so clearly Come, let us reason together. God, we hear that voice. We hear your voice calling us to come near to you. And those sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, God. Though they be crimson, they'll be as wool this morning. Father, I'm praying that someone, God, would repent, that they would turn and determine that their future will no longer be like their past today. Come on, you can make that prayer. you just let the word work beneath the surface for a moment spirit of the living God move in this place this morning I believe that God if you've never if you've never been baptized in Jesus name I I, I know that our tank's ready and I know it's warm. We've got robes that you can change into. We've got changing rooms. We've, we're prepared for, for baptism at any moment because you never know when someone sees the need for baptism. Um, so we make sure that that opportunity is available. And if that's your next step, we invite you to do it. But, but someone this morning, that, that prayer of repentance about turning from sin to God, that's, that was your next step. But the Bible tells us not to stay there. There's, there's no delayed baptisms in Scripture. There's that same hour, that same day. They were baptized. We've got time for a baptism. We've got, we've got a tree planting ceremony going to happen in 53 minutes, somewhere in between that. We've got a staff meeting with our staff. I'll forego the staff meeting for a baptism. Glad to. <clears throat> uh, we... Every member of our staff would delay a tree planting for a baptism. We all would, because we know that the eternal God is working in people's hearts. That's our priority. We want God to quicken our mortal bodies and we want His Spirit to work. And I believe that God can fill someone with the baptism of His Spirit in this room this morning, in a moment, just like that. Because we need God to work in every area of our lives. We are, we are eternal beings. And that's why when we begin to talk about this, it resonates with something on the inside of us at a level. A movie can't minister to you there. A book can't touch you there. But when you begin to preach about an eternal God that can reach you in that place. I'm wondering if someone would just let his spirit work. I'm going to open the altar. I'm wondering if somebody would come and your prayer is a prayer of repentance. We're inviting you to pray it. Your next step may be baptism. We're prepared for baptism today. But I believe that God could fill someone with his spirit this morning. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms.
I wonder if you'd just close your eyes and pause for a moment. But if you'd like to take a step toward God by representing that, coming to this altar, I wonder if you would come and just stand here. It's our custom, but it's more than a custom. It's an opportunity. It's a declaration. I, I wonder if somebody would just join me at the altar and say, God, I'm, I'm determining. See, everybody, the Bible says we can repent daily. Every day is an opportunity for us to repent, no matter which step we're at. We could be 50 years knowing God, but we can repent from some things that are working this way into our life. We can make a determination. We're going to walk with God. I'm inviting everyone to come. We're going to begin to sing. But if you want prayer this morning, we'd love to pray with you. We take a moment and pray that God would help you, direct you, order your steps, declare the path before you clear. I wonder if you just begin to sing team and we're going we're gonna to just invite people to come and pray. It's a very personal moment. It's a decision people are making right now.